Trinity. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So we welcome back uh, Professor Birch. Maxi, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. So um, here's what I'm going to do today. Once again, David and I, <clears throat> looking through the chapters, have to kind of triage a little bit, decide what we're going to be able to cover. So today I'm primarily going to focus on monasticism leading into Western monasticism and also on Augustine. So those are my, my choices of where to take us. And I hope I can get it all in. I, 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 I think about sometimes when I first start these things, uh, oh, I don't know if I'll have enough. And then before it's over like 50 slides or something, and it's like, oh gosh. So I, I kind of am being a bit ambitious, but I don't know if it's that many, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. So here we go. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with repeating Dave's slide on the idea that theolo theology matters, but not all theology matters equally. Um, I think that's a, that's a really good point that we just kind of have to stay with for a while. <clears throat> that um, theology matters, and it does. It matters because it's not just abstract thinking. It actually works its way into life, which will be the implication of everything I'm going to do today. Um, there is a theology that's associated with monasticism, and of course, we're going to talk about Augustine, who is, in some ways, um, at the core of Western theology, particularly Latin theology, and a lot of what we think of of Christian theology, particularly pertaining to the West, the reformers, uh, a lot of our Western thinking about the Bible, the, the church, who we are, the nature of all the theological issues we deal with, a lot of that is um, you can be found in his writings. And so <clears throat> theology is important, but like we said, not, only, not all of it matters equally. Um, because we have to stay focused on the core of our faith. What I make a distinction when I teach theology with my students, the difference between dogma, doctrine, and adiaphora, or dogma is the core. It's basically what we find in the, <clears throat> which I'm always appreciative that we, when we're together, um, uh, we recite the Nicene Creed, which is a way of saying, this is the core of the faith. This is what we fundamentally believe to be true. Doctrine is how we nuance those things, and that varies from tradition to tradition within Christianity. And then adiaphora is the non-essential stuff. And so how we keep those things uh, separate and recognize the kind of theology we're doing is important. So having said that, I'm going, I, I, I'm going to describe the idea that I think there's theology coming from a lot of different directions. I would describe theology from the top down, the kind of theology that comes out of the ecumenical councils, which we covered, I don't know, three weeks, four weeks ago, whatever it was, where we have at Nicaea and 325, uh, Arius' views are, um, his theology is being questioned uh, because he uh, doesn't see Jesus as um, fully God. And the Nic Nicene uh, Creed uh, eventually comes out of that. And we come up with this idea that Jesus is fully God based on Nicaea. They go to Constantinople with Apollinarius. It goes the other way around where the question is, is he fully human? <clears throat> 381, they come up with the idea, yes, he's fully human. So he's fully God, fully human. We go to Ephesus and we have Nestorius and Cyril trying to figure out, so what will be our emphasis uh, in terms of the two natures? Jesus Christ is one nature, one person, two natures, but what are we gonna emphasize? The integration of the natures which is Cyril, or the distinction of the natures, which is Nestorius. And so basically not much happens at Ephesus. They have a formula of union in 431, but, uh, uh, or excuse me, 433, but the, the, the issue comes back at Chalcedon in 451, where a guy named Eutychus says, well, the humanity to Jesus is like a drop, his, to his divinity is like a drop of honey in the ocean. Well, we, we can't do that because then he's fully divine, but his humanity gets lost. And so 
we talk about how uh, Chalcedon reaffirms Jesus Christ as one person, two natures, without confusion, division, separation, or change. So the point is, uh, theology matters, but not all theology is the same. So we're not Arians, Apollinarians, we're not Nestorians, we're not Eutychians, <laughs> we have the Nicene Creed. And this is why we, we do that in worship, we recite. So that, but I would say that's theology from the top down. The idea that bishops meet in councils, they work through these issues sometimes over decades, and then, uh, and then the rest of the church is given the results of these councils and we become Nicene Christians. But there's another way theology works. Theology from the bottom up is what I'll call monasticism. And a little bit about it, Dave covered some of it when he was speaking last Sunday, but it appears somewhat in the third century. Here's some characteristics of it. It appears primarily in Egypt and Asia Minor during periods of persecution under Decius and Diocletian. There's this emphasis on ethical purity and holiness and separation from the world as a means of achieving deeper spirituality. So this is a theology of spirituality, a theology of how does one live their life in a way in which they can commune with God, get closer to God. It's not just, a, once again, uh, our faith is not just abstract thoughts uh, developed in, in a creedal form, but it's also a life we live. And theology from the bottom up through monasticism is this, this pursuit of a, a life lived with God. So it tends to be a rural movement. Uh, moving from the city to the wilderness and the desert in order to escape the corruption that's in the world. And it's a lay movement. It, it's done, initially, it doesn't have direction or leadership or not much from the former authority structure of the church. So I, I understand monasticism as a movement created that's like a parallel structure that parallels the former leadership structure of bishops, presbyters, because it's not originally under episcopal control. Uh, the people who start this, uh, at least the original folks, they don't ask permission to leave their city and go out into the desert. I mean, they just go. And there's this sentiment, this desire to be close to God that drives them. But it's not, it's not necessarily a proved movement. I mean, there's no committee that meets and says, yeah, let's, monast let's have a movement of monasticism and so it's a it's a different kind of theology developing from the bottom up now, i know this is a lot of text but what i'm trying to point out here is there's a shift and dave refers to this when 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 we talk when i talked about the persecutions and i talked about particularly ignatius of antioch i referred to the idea that in the early first couple two two centuries of the church the highest form of discipleship was considered martyrdom that's what true discipleship was. The ultimate form of discipleship was martyrdom. It's the highest expression of the faith. And it's symbolized by martyrdom. But as the persecutions begin to end in the fourth century, then martyrdom as the symbol of true monasticism eventually is replaced by monasticism. So that the sentiment no longer is a martyr's death, but rather a, a desire to separate yourself from the world and live an ascetic detached life in communion with God. So in the fourth to fifth century, the monk replaced the martyr as the symbol of the highest virtue of Christianity, what they refer to as white martyrdom and some other forms like Celtic monasticism referred to it as green martyrdom. The sentiments of martyrdom that reflected Christian engagement with the world, and this is huge, I think, the sentiments of martyrdom that reflected Christian engagement with the world leading to persecution was replaced by monastic sentiments emphasizing disengagement with the world as a sign of Christian discipleship. You became a martyr because as a disciple of Christ, you, you were engaged with the world, you stood out, you were seen as a part of the engagement of the world and in some ways were seen as a threat. But the monastic ideal is to disengage and to live an ascetic life that's separate and apart from the world. So I think this is an interesting theological shift uh, in terms of what discipleship looks like. Two types, there's the eremitic or hermit type. We also call it the anchorite type. These are the individuals who separate from society and retreat to the desert in order to find a different relationship with God. It's just individuals doing this and the early forms of monasticism were like that. 
Then we have a different type that comes along later that we're more familiar with, the cenobitic or common life. That's the gathering of individuals in a community to seek God together. And this type requires more structure for leadership and also rules for daily living. I mean, let's put it this way. If you're by yourself, you don't really need lots of rules. But as soon as you get a roommate, mm, now you need rules. Because as soon as there's another person, then it's like, how are we going to do this together? Are we going to have common values? You know, so the hermetic hermit type doesn't require a lot of rules and guidelines, but the cenobitic or common life does. And we'll see the development of that as it moves along. So our first monastic, as many people have th thought about it, is St. Anthony of Egypt. You can see his dates there. This is the beginning of hermetic uh, monasticism. He's an Egyptian Christian born to a wealthy family. He heard a sermon on Matthew 19 about the rich young ruler, and he, he thought of himself as, well, that's me. And what Jesus tells the rich young ruler is, go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And for uh, Anthony, that was God's message to him through that sermon, so he did. He sold all he had and left the city for the desert to live an ascetic life by himself. Now, you know, I mean, you read the life of St. Anthony, which was written um, about 50 years later by a guy named Athanasius, who's the same guy who was at Nicaea. Uh, and this becomes an important uh, biography of Anthony's life. But his motivation for doing this basically had two reasons. One, he wanted to live a spiritual life in obedience to what he read in scripture. Second thing, he saw himself living a life that was separated from society almost as a social protest against injustice and the way in which the poor had been treated. He didn't want to be a part of that. He lived outside the city, but eventually he has to move east even further to the other side of the Nile to get solitude. I got Forrest Gump down there because I don't know if you remember that movie, but I remember one day he just decides to run and he gets up and he runs and he's just running. And then, and then along the way, people keep coming up to him going, oh man, this is what I'm looking for. I mean, dude, I mean, you've got the answers to life. I mean, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, yeah, this guy really understands. Well, this begins to happen. People start coming out of the desert seeking Anthony's counsel. So what are you doing out here? And, and, and what does this mean? And how can I do this? And eventually for solitude, he has to leave and go to the other side of the Nile because it's like, this is not working out. You have to find your own cave or something. Um, so you, he, he unintentionally creates this movement where he goes to seek in solitude to be in, present with God and he in, in, uh, unintentionally creates this movement where others begin pursuing God in the same way and eventually over years you see people out finding caves, places in the desert, places in the wilderness where they, are, they too are trying to seek and find God. There's a, there's a great book called The uh, Sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, which talks about the lives of these hermit monks who lived in fairly close proximity to each other, but they had their own separate, what they call a cell. And their cell was basically like a hole in the ground or a cave or just wherever they found a place. And, it, and it's this life of these hermit monks that live out in the desert and do have some interaction with each other, but essentially it's a solitary life. And so Anthony is the beginning of what we would think is what is uh, monasticism as a movement. Then you have this guy, Pacomius. You see his dates. He shifts his focus from this hermetic to a cenobitic or community monasticism. Like Anthony, he seeks this solitary life as an ascetic to live as a Christian disciple. But he gives up the solitary life in despair because he just can't pull it off. And he comes to the conclusion that he thinks people are meant to be to live in community. So he so seeks to make an ascetic living a community activity. By his death, he had founded nine monasteries and two convents. Now, uh, notice something. When we shift to the community uh, kind of monasticism, suddenly we have this order for daily living. Okay, so as soon as it's not just me, it's me and these other people. Now we have to have some structure or rhythm for life. And his monastic or, and you'll see, I mean, there's no, there's no, I mean, I mean, Jesus doesn't leave, you know, uh, 
an essay on monasticism. I mean, no one knows what, how to do this. They're sort of taking scripture, they're reading scripture there, and then working out of their own experience, trying to figure out how this is going to work. And so you see that he has this order for daily life that involves work, prayer, and meditation. Every monk had to have a job. You don't get just to hang around. Everybody's got to have a job because that's the way the community works and serves each other. Uh, you have one meal a day, no excessive fasting. And we're going to get back to that in a minute. You pray 12 times a day. You celebrate the Eucharist two times a week. And then he writes these short rules for community because he establishes all these monasteries and they have to have some kind of rhythm that connects them um, so that each Gener the idea of generationally, the next generation of monks will know how to make this work. So he's the beginning of what we think of as sort of cenobitic or communi community-based monasticism. Then you have Jerome. He's mentioned in the ch our chapter today. He's a biblical scholar and a monk, uh, born in Dalmatia, which Dalmatia is uh, the Roman province of Illyricum. It's just uh, north and west of Macedonia. Um, yeah, it's uh, Dalmatia comes from a, 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 a lyricum a word that means sheep. Um, so he's born in, born in that area of the empire. He thinks of himself as a Roman or Latin Christian. He, he really struggles uh, with classical thinkers because he loved classical learning growing up and being trained. But when, then, then when he becomes a believer and starts uh, reading in scripture and then becomes a scholar of scripture, uh, he, uh, he really struggles with whether the classical uh, thinkers really are for Christianity, whether they help us or whether they hinder us. Um, he's best known probably for lead, well, not best known, but one of the things he focuses on is this ascetic, an, an extreme asceticism. Uh, for discipleship, the, 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 the more one denies the body, uh, the, the, the more spiritual one is able to become. This whole body denying thing, which really kind of goes against the doctrine of creation in a lot of ways. But he, but he really sees those who are going to be true disciples should really deny the body, be it true ascetics in terms of extreme fasting. Um, that, uh, he's against marriage. Um, yeah, and, and this really catches on with the aristocrats in Rome. There are many among the aristocratic class that really believe that this is how they deny their, uh, their, their own life as a way of proving to God that they really are serious about being true disciples. Um, so that's, that's one thing he's known for, but, but he also writes a significant number of biblical commentaries and he translates the works of origin. So some contributions to Western monasticism. He's responsible for the Latin Vulgate, the Latin, Latin translation of the Bible. He's commissioned by Pope Damascus. It took him 23 years to write this using Greek and Latin manuscripts. And we will have to say that his Greek and his Latin were good, but his Hebrew uh, questionable at points because he's translating a section out of Exodus that talks about... Um, when Moses comes down from the mountain after receiving the commandments, and it talks about, uh, you know, our translation says a light or a, a shone from Moses's head. The problem was the Hebrew word he's translating there, or that that section in there, could be translated horns, which he does. And here's the unintended consequences of biblical translation. In 1515, uh, around that time, Michelangelo is uh, sculpting uh, his sculpture of Moses. And you can see Moses has horns. Mm. That's kind of sad, but it lets you know that not only does theology matter, but biblical translation kind of matters too, because if you don't do it right, later artists don't know what they're doing. So you have a picture there of Moses with horns. Uh, uh, other than that though, uh, you know, and I'm kind of doing this tongue in cheek because, you know, it, it does show that translation matters. But in, uh, in back in uh, 2000, I think the World Conference of Biblical Translators or something, you know, inducted him as the first person in their Hall of Fame 
for translating, but they were being serious about it. But anyway, okay. So against Jovian was another work that he had. This work established asceticism as the norm for monastic life. And I think this is what Jerome may be known for the most is this idea that being an ascetic is the norm for what it means to be a real Christian. And I mean, at least one who's going to be serious about their discipleship and their walk with God. This guy, Jovian, who he wrote against, had argued that all Christians, regardless of status, celibate, married, widowed, were equal before God in terms of spirituality. He takes this out of Colossians 2. Joan, Jerome rejects this view, and he's supported by popular opinion in the day. He argues that asceticism and monasticism were the highest forms of discipleship, and virginity was the idea for women. And this is where he has a significant influence on the pop popular appeal of uh, asceticism and monasticism, um, uh, particularly among the aristocrats in Rome is this idea that if you're really going to be a follower of Christ, this is the highest form that you can achieve. Uh, John Cassian, you can see his dates, uh, fourth century going into the fifth century. Uh, John's born on the Danube, travels to Bethlehem, joins a monastic community there, but he, eventually he leaves and uh, journeys to Gaul, which is present day France, the area of France in 1414. He's ordained a presbyter there, and he has two significant works. One is called Conferences. It's reflections on Egyptian monastic practices that he records and writes down in a significant volume. And what happens is when he begins his own monastic movement <clears throat> there in Gaul, he uses these conferences as uh, guidelines for how to establish a, com a monastic community and for the practices of the monks in that community. And it was common practice that uh, during meals, there was silence. The only one allowed to speak was one who would be reading from the conferences. And this carries on in Western monasticism as a common practice to read from the Cassian's conferences in order to remind monks about the life they're living, uh, the, uh, the, the way in which they ought to be thinking <clears throat> about their their, uh, their responsibilities, uh, thinking about their, uh, um, their spirituality. And so John Cassian's conferences uh, become a significant part of Western monastic tradition. He also writes an institute, which I would call Manual for Gimmons is like a monasticism for dummies. And so his institutes are really his, his structural guidelines for how what does a monastic community look like? How is it to be structured with the daily life and the rhythm of monasticism to be? He founds monasteries and convents, and you can see the characteristics for his understanding of monastic life. Uh, there's, once again, you see this focus on manual labor. Everybody's got a job. Um, is studying and copying of manuscripts <clears throat> that Prayer is significant, but it's through prayer that you defeat sin. And this comes out of, once again, his time with these Egyptian monks in the desert, that prayer is the way when one is assaulted by sin, when one is tempted, prayer becomes the, the immediate means by which one deflects this temptation and enters into constant communion with God. You worship five times a day. <clears throat> you can see the difference with Pacomius and others. And so once again, there's no common standard yet. Uh, focus on disengaging from the outside world. So Cassian becomes uh, a monastic leader within the West after experiencing his monastic tradition, the monastic traditions in the East, which he brings into the West and through the conferences and the institutes. And I wanted to give you an example. In the conferences, there's a chapter on how to seek discretion. And these are the kinds of things they would read at meals. We ought then with all our might to strive for the virtue of discretion by the power of humility, as it will keep us uninjured by either extreme. Now you're going to notice these monastic orders are always trying to balance the tension between um, the normal daily life of, of communication and work with with some of the extremes that have been present because of uh, Jerome's emphasis on asceticism. So you see within monastic, Western monasticism, particularly the struggle with maintaining the tension there. So he says, uh, the virtue of discretion by the power of humility as it will keep us 
uninjured by either extreme. For there is an old saying, acrothes isotes, extremes meet. For ex excess of fasting and gluttony come to the same thing. And an unlimited continuance of vigils is equally injurious to a monk as the torpor of a deep sleep. For when a man is weakened by excessive abstinence, he is sure to return to that condition in which a man is kept through carelessness and negligence. So that we have often seen those who could not be deceived by gluttony destroyed by excessive fasting and by reason of weakness liable to that passion which they had before overcome. So he said, you, it, it, this, something that is good can become evil when it's taken to an extreme. And what he insists upon is the idea of maintaining balance. And this is where it's the idea of make, getting a healthy rhythm for life so that one doesn't uh, overemphasize some form of spirituality to, to actually to the detriment of your spiritual life. Uh, and then there's Benedict of Nursia. Um, <clears throat> this this uh, monastic leader it would be seen as the person who um, provides the continuity for Western monasticism. Um, you can see his dates, uh, sixth century. He founds a monastery at Monacassino, Italy. They're known as the Benedictines. And what you'll find in Western monasticism is monks oftentimes could tell the difference between the different monastic orders by the color of their habit, color of their robe, or the shape of the hood or a combination. These Benedictines are known as black monks because their, their habit, their robes were black. <clears throat> the Benedictine monastic tradition and rule became the standard for Western monasticism in the ninth century. He was very practical in his approach to monasticism, avoiding the extremes of asceticism and the anchorite or hermet hermetic traditions. He wrote what we call the Benedictine rule that established the organization for his monastery. And then the Benedictine rule for the Benedictine order will essentially become the foundation for rules for Western monasticism that will be present in other monastic traditions following him like Cistercians and others. Uh, this is a map showing you where a uh, casino was. Uh, I'm showing this because you can see its proximity to Rome. Um, let me see if I can do my little, uh-oh. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Um, yeah, no, there's corner. There it is. Um, yeah, I don't want to go back. Um, this is Casino, Rome, and then I don't know if any of you are familiar. We also we have a Benedictine monastery here in Arkansas, it's called uh Subiaco, and it's just south of here. Um, um, you it's actually you turn off the interstate on your way to when we go to our retreats. <clears throat> but what I want you to notice is. Mount Casino or Monte Casino is located right here and it's right, it overlooks and controls the main route up to Rome through this valley. Um, and so he establishes his monastery on top of this mountain and it's very significant um, strategically. In World War II, when the allies are pushing north, heading to Rome, they have to go through this valley and in order to get through this valley, they have to pass by Monte Cassino and the, the Wehrmacht, the German troops had established artillery and a post up here on Cassino for the allies to actually make it to Rome. Um, uh, let's say the, the monastery didn't survive. Uh, this is the way it looks today. Uh, it's been rebuilt, but in 1944, after continual aerial bombardment uh, by the allies in order to get past this on their way to Rome, this is what uh, the monastery looked like in 1944. So you can see it was a, it's a beautiful place, but it's been rebuilt uh, somewhat close to its original specifications. Uh, but you can see even here, it's on this huge mountaintop that surrounds this valley. Um, so yeah.
So in World War II, it becomes a significant place. Uh, a little bit from the Benedictine rule. Uh, I wanted to read two things from it. One, uh, their rule about silence. And this is very much true and taken once again from even the, from the Eastern forms of monasticism. Um, <clears throat> this idea of silence and solitude are, are core foundations and values for monastic uh, life. For silence, Benedictine says, wherefore, even though it's always good and holy conversation that tends to edification, let talk be granted to fully trained disciples on account of the importance of silence. Because it is written, in much speaking, thou wilt not escape sin. And elsewhere, death and life are in the power of the tongue. For to speak and to teach becomes the master. To be silent and to listen beseems the disciple. And so if anything has to be asked of the superior, the, the abbot, the head monk, let it be asked with all humility and with reverent subjection. But all manner of buffoonery, idle and mirth provoking words should be perpetually restrained in every place. And for such discourse, we permit not the disciple to open his mouth. So this idea of silence is maintained in these monastic orders and oftentimes they have periods of absolute silence where there is no conversation, there is no talking. Um, and the only exception, once again, for many of these would be during the meal time when you read John Cassian's uh, conferences. Just a reminder to monks about the life they're living and the kind of spirituality they're seeking. So this is, this is a good example of the monastic value of silence, solitude. Now, my favorite one is the next one. <laughs> it's because it shows you how practical this is all is. <laughs> My favorite one is about wine. Benedict says, everyone has his own proper gift from God. One after this manner, another after that. And so it's with some misgiving we appoint the measure of other men's living. However, duly considering the infirmity of the weak, we believe that half a pint of wine per head per day suffices. But let those to whom God has given the power of the endurance of abstinence know they shall have their due reward. But if the necessities of the place or the work or the heat of the summer should call for more, let it stand within the discretion of the superior to grant more taking care that neither surfeiting nor drunkenness creep in. My favorite part. Although <laughs> we read that wine is not for monks at all, because in our time, the monks cannot be persuaded of this. At all times, let us agree that we will not drink to excess, but somewhat sparingly because wine makes even the wise to fall away. So with all the spirituality going on here, Benedict is pretty clear, not all the monks are convinced that everything pertains to spirituality. And when it comes to how much wine to drink, uh, yeah, he's probably encouraging them not as much because here's the deal. Monasticism was based on this idea that you, everything you do, all the work you do, you do to the glory of God. I mean, you work hard for God's glory. Well, what happens when you work hard? Well, you become successful. So these monasteries were almost sometimes, they were established in these really difficult, craggy, rocky places, you know, in Western Europe. And they'd take these swampy areas and drain them and build this monastery. And they worked really hard. And then they would, you know, plant crops and they would, you know, raise sheep and cattle and they would harvest their crop and they would plant vineyards and you know a few years later well you have great bread great cheese great wine and then you kind of forget that all this ascetic stuff and monasteries suddenly become the place where everybody wants to come because they practice hospitality particularly the benedictines you know treat you as the they, you know, they, they welcome you as they welcome Christ. <clears throat> so you go and you get, gosh, great bread, great wine, great cheese. So after a while, uh, ascetic industry 
equals material prosperity. Hmm. So that's going to be an issue that monks are going to have to deal with for years. Ascetic industry equals material prosperity. Anyway, okay. So the other thing he establishes is this idea of the monastic offices or hours. And they take this uh, as a rhythm of their life. They take this out of Psalm uh, 119, which says, seven times a day will I praise you. I will awake at midnight to confess you. So the ancient world divides the day into 12 parts or hours from sunrise to sunset. Uh, the Roman legionnaires call this a watch. At night, there are four watches from six to nine, nine to 12, 12 to three and three to six. And so those are the watches of the night. Well, the monastic order is also broken into these hours. Lauds, which means the praises, is the church's uh, morning prayer at sunrise. Prime is the first hour, according to the ancient way of dividing the day around 6 a.m., depending on the time of the year. Ter uh, the three, third, six, and ninth hours are 9, 12, and 3. Vespers, the church's evening prayers at sunset. Compline, recited after sunset, just before they retire. And then Matins, the midnight uh, office of prayer. And so this is how they divide the day up. And so there, there, this, there's, this, there's this rhythm of work and prayer, work and prayer, work and prayer. And lawns and vespers are the most important hours because they begin and end the day as opus day, uh, the work of God. So the work of God is not just prayer, but also the work we do together. So, so for, um, for Benedict, the, the monastic uh, rhythm of life is orare et laborare, prayer and work. And you could bring it the other way and say, to pray is to work, to work is to pray. And this idea of the rhythm of my life is constantly remembering and reorienting myself to God. So when I'm working, my work can become a form of prayer. When I'm praying, I'm also doing the work of God, uh, seeking the presence of God, seeking to be in God's presence. And so these monks are constantly reorienting themselves through the day. We work and then we pray. So there's communal praise and worship, manual labor. At Subiaco, when I visited there, uh, they had one monk. He's responsible just for uh, making sure that the holiday peppers are uh, done right and because they make great salsa but they need the peppers and so they have one monk that's his job great you know grow the peppers so you know everybody has this labor some were labored in the field some with sheep uh, but they also had this practice of Lectio Divina the praying of scripture this meditative reading of the bible but in order to do that, monks have to be taught to read in order to practice prayer and devotion. Now, he's not particularly, this is another unintended consequence of history. Benedict is not particularly a lover of education or liberal arts, but this practice of Lectio Divina, the copying of scripture and meditation, is going to make the monastery the center of learning in the medieval world for reasons he didn't fully intend, but that's, that's another story. But this Benedictine order becomes the standardization of Western monasticism for years to come. This is a picture of our friend Dave. You can see this is the Coptic St. Anthony Coptic Monastery established in 325 in Jerusalem. And this monk is a Coptic monk that Dave met years before and I took a picture of them when Dave took me up there to this monastery and we were at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and you can see him sitting with this, this Coptic monk whose tradition stretches all the way back and they consider Anthony to be the foundation of their monastery. So let's talk about <clears throat> Augustine. I <clears throat> uh, hope we can get through this. Uh, quickly, he's a transitional figure, significant. If, you, if I would encourage you to read anything, read his confessions. Because what it tells us about is a classical world that's being lost. Uh, his thought, theology, bridges the world of the classical world that's being lost with the fall of Rome that's going to take place in the 5th, 6th century. And he's going to help bridge that classical world of understanding with the world that's about to come, which is um, uh, the medieval world. Uh, both medieval scholasticism and 16th century Protestantism are indebted to his work. Uh, in fact, many would say the very psyche of Western civilization after the fall of Rome and beyond was established in this person's works. 
uh, his confession is like a forerunner of the first modern psyche. I mean, today we're very familiar with all these autobiographies. Everybody writes an autobiography, but in his day, that was not the case. In fact, he's the first to write as I. This is not about us. This is about me. He reveals this hidden inner life with all the complexity and duplicity of what it means to actually be a person who's owning their life, being aware of their own sin, and not relating it to the larger culture, but just unpacking his own personal existence. <clears throat> a little bit of his uh, biography quickly, and it's a good example of theology being biography. He's born in Thagas, North Africa. Uh, his mother, Monica, his father, Patricius, who's a tax collector, uh, dies in, he's, uh, Augustine's 15. He's schooled in Carthage uh, in rhetoric, which is how he's going to make his living. He takes a concubine at 16. He's a father in 17. His son's name is Adiodatus. He teaches rhetoric in Thagas, Carthage, and Milan. He has this search for truth, which you find in the confessions. And he talks about, he desperately searching for God, <clears throat> but he's trying a lot of things along the way. Manichaeism, Platonism, before he finally converts. Uh, significant influences, his mother, uh, you know, she's constantly praying for this wayward boy. Uh, Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, and then the uh, monastic uh, biography of uh, St. Anthony. He's converted at age 32, ordained in 391 as a priest, and in 395, he's elected by proclamation, by acclaim, as the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. Basic controversies are significant ones. Uh, one would be a controversy that involves soteriology or salvation with a guy named Pelagius. The other is over Donatism, which is a ecclesiology issue. Uh, Pelagius is a British monk trained in law. His main thing is, I don't think people are taking seriously their moral responsibility for, for the life they're supposed to live before God. People are making the excuse, this is just the way I am. I can't do any better. I'm not a priest. Uh, so Pelagius says, look, you are responsible. Uh, God wouldn't give you a law you weren't able to do. So get busy living and being honoring to God. Uh, Augustine's problem with this is it tends to undermine, in his mind, the biblical understanding of both law and the atonement of Christ. And so the two of them, even though he doesn't argue particularly with per per Pelagius directly, he does argue with his disciples. Uh, a quick view of the differences between these two. <clears throat> One is this idea of the natural state of humanity. Uh, for Pelagius, we're uh, innocent. We come into this world innocent with free will, but we're mortal. We would have died whether we sinned or not. Uh, Augustine says, no, we're, I agree we're innocent with free will, but we're inclined toward the good, therefore capable of immortality. Regarding the fall, Pelagius says, well, the fall just results in spiritual death for Adam, but he would have died physically anyway. So for him, Adam's sin does not affect the future condition of humanity, except that Adam's a bad example. Don't be like Adam. So we don't have to worry about infant baptism because infants aren't born in the world sinners. Uh, they're born in the world free and they're born in the world uh, human and to be human is not to be necessarily sinful. But Augustine says the fall results in spiritual and physical death. And through Adam, all humanity is enslaved to sin. Therefore, we're born in the world. We're brought in the world equal, I mean, guilty. So there is a need for infant baptism because we've got to find some way to cover infants with the grace of God because they're born to the world sinful. Pelagius and Augustine will disagree over the will. Uh, Pelagius will say the will is always free to choose good and evil, both before and after the fall. Augustine says, no, there are two conditions of the will. Before the wall, it's passe non peccari, possible not to sin. But after the fall, it's non passe non peccari. You, it's not possible not to sin. So there's a difference between these two on the will and whether the will is free. And if the will is free, when is it free? And then the issue of sin, Pelagius says, you're sinners because you sin. Stop, stop sinning. Exercise your will. Exercise the will because the essence of how you're born to the world is you're born free and the possibility God has given to you, exercise the will. Stop sinning. Augustine says, we sin because we're sinners. It's our nature. We can't stop. 
because we have a heart in rebellion against God. So there's a huge difference on the issue of grace. For Pelagius, grace is a natural endowment of will and intellect given to us by God in order to obey God's law. It's natural, we're born with it, it's innate. Augustine says, God has to grant us a grace outside of our own efforts because we're not possible not to sin. The fall is often in a brokenness and a fallenness and we can't fix ourselves. We cannot will to love God on our own. Salvation from beginning to end is a work of God's grace. So Pelagius is condemned by several African synods, and then in April of 1418, he and his followers are banished by imperial edict as dangerous to the empire's peace. So this is a significant theological debate that Augustine's a part of, and frankly, Pelagianism, though banished by the empire, doesn't go away. It still becomes a significant theological position present within uh, Western Christianity. Uh, I don't know if we'll get through this. Donatism and it's an ecclesiological issue. The Donatist were Numidians. This is uh, this purple area here is Numidia. It's a movement that happens uh, after and during some of the serious uh, persecutions. And it's about uh, priests and bishops who were traditores, uh, or in other words, they were traitors because during the persecution, they turned over scriptures to be burned and turned in other Christians and things like that. And when the persecutions ended, the decision was made to reinstate them, to bring them back into the church. And the Donatists said, you can't do that because what they've done is a sin that takes them outside the bounds of the grace of God in the church. So the issues for the Donatists were the issue of purity. They said, look, the true church is pure, true clergy are pure. Therefore, a pure church would need its members to be rebaptized by pure clergy, and only those pure clergy can administer the Eucharist. Lapsed people, these traitors, are not pure. Therefore, the sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, are administered with no effect. They don't provide God's grace. The church and the state, the church and its clergy should not allow the state to interfere with the church because of the persecutions that have happened. And this is when Constantine is trying to secure the empire. Thus, the Donatists broke with the Catholic Church, selected their own bishops and priests, and formed their own Donatist Church. Augustine's argument was they were schismatics. They broke with the universal church. He goes back to Cyprian of Carthage's idea of extra ecclesia nulla solis, outside the church, no salvation. And that, that understanding was outside the Catholic Church, no salvation. Well, now we have a Donatist Church claiming that they are the pure people, the pure clergy, and only the sacraments are valid if administered by them. So uh, Augustine argues against them. He uses primarily the parable of the wheat and tares where Jesus says, hey, a landowner goes out, he sows wheat during the night, an enemy comes and sows the tares. His workers come and go, hey, someone sowed weeds during the night. Should we pull it up? And the landowner says, no, don't do that. Because if you pull up the tares, you also tear up the wheat. So Augustine's purpose there is to say there's no visibly pure church. There's a visible church that we see, but there's an invisible church only God sees. And in the city of God, he's going to argue that in this world, the church will contain both true believers and charlatans. Only God knows the true church. And he's the only one that gets to judge who they are. And then he argues significantly the difference between ex opere operato and ex opere operantes. Ex opere operato means the sacraments work because they work. Ex opere operantes is the Donatist position. It works because of the one working it, the priest, the one who administers it. So, uh, Augustine will argue that sacraments of fit, e e efficacy is based on God's work, not on the spiritual moral condition of the clergy who administers it. And this becomes the official position of the church. It's not based on the moral and spiritual perfection of the priest, but rather on the work of God. And then finally, in his letters, he declares the Donatists to be heretics and their Donatist church is outside the law. In January 412, by imperial edict, uh, the Donatist church is declared to be um, an, an illicit church. Uh, 
if you will, um, property is taken from them. They are they lose positions, and Augustine basically uh, agrees with the state that there are times in which the state must step in and persecute even other Christians because they're outside the bounds of the proper church. He even uses this phrase out of uh, Matthew about the banquet: "Compel them to come in," and he uses this as a scriptural. Uh, defense to allow the state to persecute these Christians. It's kind of a sad story. And uh, so uh, with all people, Augustine is uh, kind of a good news, bad news, if you will, the way in which once again, theology gets used. Now I know we're running out of time here and I'm conscious of that. I'll look really quick, maybe a minute or two at his city of God and then be done. Um, he writes the city of God at the end of his life. Uh, the Roman Empire is collapsing. The Visigoths are invading North Africa. And people are saying, hey, the reason this is happening is because we haven't depended upon the Roman gods. If we can just get back to the Roman gods, we'll be good. And he writes the city of God in effect to say, uh, that's an improper understanding of the role of state and the, and the true identity of the church. So he basically says there's two cities. There's the city of God and the city of man. He says the city of man is a human government and it's always going to fail. I don't think this is a good, good thing to be, for us to be reading in our own day. All governments, he says, are destined to fail because they're directed on self-love, not for a love of God. They serve a purpose of order and justice, but always to a limited degree. They control the effects of sin, but never eradicate it. They can only achieve relative peace and relative order at best. Don't put your faith in a government to do ultimately the work that only God can do. So that's the city of man. The city of God, he says, is the church, but it's not the embodiment of the city of God, but the anticipation of it. Because the church is affected by sin. It's not perfect. It's a society in which God's grace is at work. This is the, the key. The church is the shadow of a redeemed humanity, a redeemed human society that will be the final outcome of God's purpose, but it, we're not there yet. So he sets up this difference between these two cities and where we should put our confidence and our faith. And then finally, Max's point to ponder, theology matters. There's theology from the top down. But there's also theology from the bottom up as a way in which we express our faith and our commitment to Christ and then finally, what we believe, the way we believe it, are important, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, theology has relational, social, and political consequences. So that's my deal. Questions? Thank you, Maxie. Any questions, comments? There's something from Gary. Maxie, do you see that? Uh, In the okay. chat. I'm looking forward to my chat place. Do I have to? It's on the bottom of my screen. You want me to read it? Yeah, would you? Yeah, couldn't one art, Gary says, couldn't one argue that the statement theology matters, but not all theology matters equally should be theology matters, and my theology matters to me more than other theologies. The implications <laughs> of some beliefs may lead to what we think is wrong or even outrageous, Moses having horns. But as for choosing what is important, true, false, in theology, each tradition develops its own priorities. Only God knows the truth, question mark, or the true theology, question mark. Yeah, I, I think there's real truth to that, uh, what Gary's saying. I think I go back to what I kind of share with my students, that there's a difference between dogma and doctrine. There is dogma that I think we have to at least recognize that in saying, is there something that the church has held to be the core of the faith from the beginning that we would find, let's say, as the core of what, it, what the gospel is? And has the church held to that, even though on the perimeters of that dogma, that, that core, those core beliefs, there are all these doctrinal nuances that are present within all the traditions of Christianity about how you practice baptism or how you practice Eucharist or <clears throat> how you practice prayer or how you do some of these things, or even 
the way in which the church would respond or various Christians respond to social issues or political issues or wherever. I think there's a lot of periphery of that, but, but I would say that the church has held that there is a central core of what we believe is at the center of our faith that is focused on the person of Christ and the nature of what the gospel is. So I think there is something that holds us together and binds us and gives us a common core, even though to Gary's point, once you extrapolate beyond that, then we have all these doctrinal nuances of how do we practice that and how do we live that out. Someone has said, uh, Max, if you don't mind me interjecting, in essentials mm -hmm. unity and non-essentials freedom in all things love. Right. And may maybe that's another way to say that. Yeah. Max, Good question. You... Yeah, George. Um, Augustine taught that the sin of man comes through the male. And because of that, uh, Jesus has to be born of a virgin. Be correct on that? Yeah, this is where, you know, <laughs> this is where you, you know, I personally would want to sit down with Augustine and say, you know, I think I would have just stuck with the, uh, we share something with Adam that uh, sort of um, is true of all of us. But when he starts trying to do uh, the whole, uh, the way in which it happens, the process, the DNA, when he starts going that way, it's like, uh, but yeah, you're right, George. And I think your point is well taken. I also tell this to my students, all theology is connected. So once you've said something about one thing, you've probably said it about eight things simultaneously. So you're right. If you say, well, it's through the male, it's biological, you know, it's sperm and egg, and you start, oh, and it's like, oh gosh, you start going there, then you're right. All of a sudden, wow, then it's important about Mary has to be this and the virgin birth. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden you have to start arguing really finely nuanced things about processes that are not uh, necessarily readily readily available to us in scripture. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Maxie, I'll, I'll jump in on that just for a second too. One of the things I would, when I was teaching this at JBU, I would say to my students is, um, you find in, in the history of Christianity, when people try to explain the mystery of God out of who God is, that's when they get into trouble. <laughs> Somebody was trying to get in there. Somebody else? Sorry, I'm seeing my chat thing. Do I have to stop sharing to see the chat? Uh, I don't know. There, I don't see another chat there, Maxine. Okay. I, I thought I heard a female voice. Oh, there. Yeah, I have to stop sharing to see the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. Was there somebody else who had a question or comment that we missed? Okay. Next week, uh, Maxi, uh, is it chapter 10 for those that are reading? Mm, I think so. Latin, Latin Christendom New Frontiers 500 to 1000. Yeah, I think that's right. Is that right? Okay. I think that's right. Thank you, sir. Well done. And thanks, everybody, for being here. See you next week.